Greetings, everyone. This is Larry Stevens. I'm the Curator of Biology at the Museum of Northern Arizona. The subject of today's talk is Hidden Waters, Grand Canyon Springs. I've worked now in Grand Canyon for almost 50 years. So the waters there have saved my life many, many times. And finding springs in the desert is just a truly magical experience. So today I'll take you through a bunch of background about the about the landscape. I'd also like to um, introduce you to first, though, to the museum and its history in Northern Arizona and Grand Canyon. The Museum of Northern Arizona has a has a long history of research in Grand Canyon. Walter McDougall started back in the I think the 19 teens uh, collecting plants there, and he was a, a botanist here at MNA and, uh, until 1976 when he when he passed away at the age of 96. Eddie McKee. Not a museum employee, but a, a close affiliate of the museum and research associate, uh, world famous geologist, started out as the, the first naturalist of Grand Canyon. Steve Carruthers, longtime uh, uh, biology uh, curator here at MNA, a uh, very prominent architect of Colorado River management, and, uh, and a very important naturalist here in the Southwest, conducted the first ecological inventory of Grand Canyon in 1976, the first to place fish. The, the native fisheries into perspective there. He was largely responsible for setting up the management strategy to remove uh, feral burrow grazing from Grand Canyon, which is a really big deal in the river corridor, and advised widely on the management of Glen Canyon Dam. All right, so to get to Grand Canyon, of course, you have to understand where we are in the landscape. The Colorado River Basin, huge area of land, 250,000 square miles, Grand Canyon is located about the middle of the course of the river. The river is 2,133 kilometers long, 1,400 miles long from the headwaters of the Green River down to the Sea of Cortez. You know, it's, it's the water supply for the, for the Southwest. Basically, a lot of the water from Los Angeles, San Diego, Tucson, Phoenix, Las Vegas comes from the canals of the lower Colorado River. The, the upper basin, Colorado Plateau, is kind of a a landscape with much a lot of wildness to it. It's it's kind of a, a a landscape that gets exploited for all kinds of resources, particularly water, wood, minerals, and recreational experience. Whereas the lower Colorado River Basin, shown in yellow and brown, there is really the kind of resource using portion of the basin. Grand Canyon falls right in the middle, right at the kind of the boundary between the two. What's kind of important to remember about Grand Canyon is that. You're standing there on the rim, looking into the edge. Every natural environment that you can think of, from the deepest ocean to the highest mountains, has existed at one time or another right below your feet. You, you name it, it's happened there. Vul volcanism, you know, uh, deserts, oceans, swamps, rivers, you name it, it's, it's, uh, it's occurred right there. And, and with leaving some remains of uh, life and the uh, uh, geology from, that, from those time frames. But for us, the story of the canyon begins to come into focus geologically about 20 million years ago with the, the uh, development of the, uh, the Miocene landscape beginning about 20, 25 million years ago. The, the creatures that live in Grand Canyon, some of them, many of them have their roots going back into that Miocene time period. Pliocene time uh, was a, the epoch was a, was a period of desertification. So the uh, Sierra Nevada and the other mountain ranges in Nevada and, and uh, Arizona rose up as the great as the Basin and Range geologic province developed, creating a rain shadow, and that set the stage for the the modern day arid environments that we have in Grand Canyon. A funny thing happened 2.6 million years ago in that South America, which had been a free floating island, touched North America for the first time, resulting in a, a land bridge and a faunal and floral exchange with 150 species, uh, sorry, 150 genera of plants and animals found in South America and here in the Southwest as a result of that land bridge. That was a big deal, biologically. During the Pleistocene, we didn't have glaciers on covering in the Grand Canyon because of the terrain is too, too complex, but we certainly had ice fields and some glaciers up in the mountains uh, around, the, around the canyon. Uh, we had Pleistocene lava flows that created huge lakes in, in, the, in the region. And uh, so that, that, uh, those changes have been pretty dramatic. And then in recent times, especially the last 10,000 years and particularly the last century or so, the landscape has really increased in its desert-like character. So the Grand Canyon region today is a crossroads of ecosystems. Four uh, of North America's biomes occur here. 
uh, spread stretch across two geologic provinces. We have more than a two mile elevation range from the bottom of Grand Canyon to the top of the San Francisco peaks and tremendous biological diversity. 2,500 plant species, at least 500 vertebrate species, more than 20,000 20, macroinvertebrate species, but we haven't finished that tally yet. That'll take another couple of lifetimes. Grand Canyon is today getting better known because of a number of re uh, really wonderful researchers. George Billingsley and Haiti Hampton mapped the rim edge of Grand Canyon. George is the only person who's actually probably hiked in the entire periphery of Grand Canyon. Their map uh, illuminated the fact that we've got two basins in Grand Canyon, an eastern basin that's quite isolated and a western basin that's more connected to the Mojave and Sonoran Desert to the, uh, to the west and south. And so Havasu and Cataract Creek are the canyons that come in right in the middle of that Moab Gorge, which really is kind of cliffs from river to rim and separates the two, these two basins. We have endemic uh, terrestrial species in the eastern basin. Most many of our terrestrial species like Grand Canyon Pink Rattlesnake and uh, Aaron Ross's Euphorb and the Grand Canyon Century Vetch are species of the eastern basin. Not so many in the western basin, but in terms of aquatic endemics, so terrestrial, terrestrial endemics in the eastern basin, um, but aquatic uh, endemics in both basins. So we'll talk about those more because most of those aquatic endemics are spring specialists. But this is quite, quite a remarkable landscape. At no point on the, when you're standing at the rim, at no point can you see more than about 5% of the entire landscape. So it's a, a, it's a landscape that takes a long time to get to even begin to know, and, and nobody really knows the whole thing. Also relevant to our talk about springs, in this region, elevation equals climate. With this more than two mile elevation gradient, we've got seven different life zones expressed from the top of the peaks down to the bottom of the canyon and more than 60 different ecosystems and tremendous variation in precipitation, relative humidity and, uh, and temperature across that elevation gradient. So to get to our topic today, which is about springs, I wanna talk a little bit about springs in general and then talk about their distribution from a regional levels, national continental levels down to Grand Canyon. I want to talk about the, the sources of water and the types of springs that we have in the landscape, how physical influence, uh, what the physical influences are on those habitats, what lives there, the human impacts upon them, and then uh, some of the stewardship issues that, that uh, uh, have emerged. As in everything we do at the museum, the study of Grand Canyon and the Colorado Plateau is really a stepping stone to understanding global issues. Global environmental stewardship is a, is a huge issue, not only for springs, but also for, for many of our other aquatic and terrestrial resources. And when we get to see an organism like this moth on the right side, which is Petrophila bifasciatus, is a, a springs-dependent uh, aquatic moth, you know, every, every species has a just tremendous story to tell. And uh, an aquatic moth, the only uh, genus in the, in the world. So on to springs. Why do we? Why are we interested in springs? Springs are very abundant on Earth, uh, but they're places where groundwater reaches and usually flows from the Earth's surface. And they can be underwater, they can be on land, they can be under glaciers. Uh, and they occur in a, in a great number of, of uh, uh, settings. The main thing about springs as ecosystems is this subsurface to surface linkage. So they're, they're, they are groundwater dependent, but it's the interaction with the surface world that makes them so remarkably complex and diverse. Uh, in the background here is a, is a seafloor vent, uh, a spring type we call a black smoker. This is a, uh, a spring that uh, develops at the edge of the spreading zone of the tectonic plates on the seafloor. These are settings that are uh, getting better known. They were only discovered in the, in the 1970s, but remarkably similar in many ways to desert springs in that they host large numbers of unique species and they're highly dynamic ecosystems. They are certainly of interest to a lot of biologists, geochemists, et cetera, because these may be the place where life originated. And not only that, but also all the water on Earth is recycled through seafloor vent springs every, every eight to 10 million years. So these are incredibly cool, important things to, to uh, be able to look at. Underwater and on land, springs function as keystone ecosystems, inter ecologically highly interactive little points on the Earth that, that influence uh, everything around them. 
Springs serve as paleorefugia, meaning places where ancient life forms uh, are preserved because of their constancy and, and uh, protection they offer from, from other environmental factors. In the United States, we estimate that springs support more than 10% of the endangered species. We're working on a paper to try to define that more closely, but of the 1700 list, listed species in the US, it looks like more than 10% of them are, are springs dependent. But beyond that, springs support huge numbers of rare, very poorly uh, known species and a whole bunch of species that haven't even been described yet. However, as water, and especially in arid regions, springs are, are really gravely threatened by all kinds of human activities. However, the good news there is that springs are pretty resilient, they're pretty sustainable and restorable if the, if the aquifer remains intact. So with a little bit of kind of guidance, they can be managed in a way that's actually uh, ecologically quite sustainable in relation to human use. I go into bits of consideration about how to understand what springs are. This is a conceptual model that Abe Springer and I uh, put together uh, a while back, but have, have refined. And, and what it does is, is um, set the stage of springs as, as ecosystems as being bottom-up ecosystems. The geologic context, the aquifer, regional climate interactions are all physical processes, geographic processes that influence uh, the, 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 where the water emerge, emerges, the geomorphology of the site, the microclimate that develops around it, and those, those take place in a, uh, within a disturbance regime. If it's, it's a spring coming out of a cliff face, rockfall could be an issue. If it's a spring coming out in a, in a, uh, in a riverbed, of course, flooding is, a, is an issue. And that also interacts with productivity, uh, how productive the landscape, uh, that, that patch of the landscape is. So that whole suite of physical factors and processes affects the microhabitats and the soils that develop at a spring that they serve as the template on which through biogeographic processes of colonization, species arrive at and either uh, take over or fail at the spring over time. So when you visit a spring, you see, uh, you see species composition, you see an array of plant and animal species that maybe may or may not be interacting with each other, uh, at least uh, they're, they're, they're present and, and kind of functioning in that landscape. You see a, a, the ecosystem, that ecosystem changes through time. Your first visit may look, uh, the spring may have one configuration. Second time you're there, hmm, that's odd. A, an elephant has moved into my spring and, and ripped out all the trees. Third time you're there, well, a fire swept through the landscape and burned the rest of the trees. And, and now the spring is, is, uh, is turned into a, uh, a very open wetland uh, and very profusely growing wetland. So that's the ecological context of springs. Humans step in extracting goods and services, particularly water, minerals, wildlife, wood, et cetera, recreation experiences, and they can affect pretty much all the functioning of the rest of the ecosystem. So this ecosystem diagram is useful uh, in terms of framing where how interactions take place. It's probably too complicated to, uh, to empirically model, but it's at least it's a, it's a start at, at, a, at understanding how springs function. So that's talking about kind of the background conceptual basis of springs. Let's take a little bit about, take a look at, at springs that are distributed around the, um, around the nation here. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a map of the named springs of the US. There's 35,000 springs that are named in the US. And you can see that uh, some very interesting patterns emerge in that springs are concentrated in areas of high topographic relief. The Western US, Sierras, the Rockies, the Ozarks and Appalachians. Um, uh, but not so much in the, in the Great Plains. These uh, open grassland situations have rel relatively few springs. So at a national level, springs are, are forming in, in complex, they, they emerge in complex terrain. You see the same pattern in Arizona. Uh, Arizona, uh, so far we've documented about 10,300 reported springs, but we're still counting and still discovering new ones and um, could be a, exciting adventures to come with, with finding some uh, more springs in Arizona. There are some big areas that haven't been explored at all yet. But again, it's the Mugion Rim. This is the edge of the Colorado Plateau, Grand Canyon area, uh, some of the mountain ranges in the northeastern corner of the state, the Sky Islands mountain ranges. All of these are places with, um, with uh, high densities of springs. But the southwestern quarter of Arizona, pretty low in terms of its uh, spring density. 
water is quite scarce there. So springs are clustered along escarpments and places where the aquifer edges are exposed. In Arizona, in Grand Canyon, in the, in the entire world, very few springs have actually been inventoried. Here in Arizona, we've been working here for 10 years on springs. We've got about 10% of the springs in the landscape have been inventoried. And the kind of alarming part of that is that more than 70, 75% of these are in degraded condition, primarily because of livestock grazing and dewatering of, of uh, big urban areas. Uh, I've got this presented in a, a recent paper by myself, Jeff Janess, and Jerry Ledbetter at Spring Stewardship Institute. And uh, if anybody wants that, just get a hold of me, and I'm happy to happy to share that paper with you. All right, in Grand Canyon itself, uh, the, the the lower map shows Grand Canyon again. It's hard to see all the springs because it's a big landscape and the dots are small. But uh, um, we started with a list from the Park Service with with, nine, with 87 springs on it. And we, we've now got uh, 10,050, uh, not counting another 150 that are up on the North Kaibab. Oddly, there's only one spring on the South Kaibab National Forest and that's dry. Um, we also haven't looked, uh, we haven't included in this list the number of springs that are in the upper Little Colorado River drainage. There are hundreds of springs up there that haven't been mapped yet. But, um, but uh, certainly Grand Canyon has a very high density. Again, multiple aquifers are, are stacked here. The Mesozoic rocks on the, uh, on the, uh, above the Kaibab limestone on the rim and is stepping down the Coconino sandstone and finally the Redwall limestone uh, are three of the three aquifers that are stacked on top of each other. And many of the springs in the, in the region come out either from the, the base of the Coconino sandstone or the base of the, of the Redwall limestone. Because of the extent of coverage of both Kaibab limestone and Mississippi and Redwall limestone in the canyon. Grand Canyon is, is the uh, park with the second most extensive karstic terrain, meaning limestone that's been worked by water. And uh, so uh, the karst terrain is, uh, transmits a lot of water in very complicated ways in Grand Canyon. Where do springs come from? Springs come almost entirely from precipitation. Rainfall, snow melt, seeps into the ground, passes into the, these aquifers that are bodies of rock that are fractured, that, can, that they're able to hold the water. And then depending on the tilt on those rocks, the water uh, gradually or rapidly moves in, uh, in the direction of the, of the down tilt. But um, it's surprising usually for people to learn that more than 90% of the incoming precipitation in Arizona is lost to evaporation. Only about 3% of it makes it into, the, into, the, into groundwater. So you know, we're living in a dry state to begin with, but um, very, very little of the incoming uh, water actually goes into the ground. Uh, we have uh, we have aquifers that are Pleistocene in age here in in, uh, uh, in Grand Canyon, uh, waters that are that are more than 10, 12,000 years old. Uh, so it's been a very gradual process. In wetter times, like during the Pleistocene, there there must have been much more uh, infiltration. But now it's a very trivial amount of water actually going into the into the into the landscape. But almost all of it comes from from precipitation, and so the uh, snowpack in the upper elevations, rainfall at the lower elevations, passing infiltrating water in along fault lines, creating flow paths that, that uh, can be either quite short, producing at high elevations water that's cool, uh, cool or cold and low in mineral content, to flow paths that are extremely long, uh, taking. In the case of, let's say, Montezuma Well, 13,000 years to flow from the San Francisco peaks to out to Montezuma Well, several several sets of springs in Grand Canyon where the flow paths are more than 3,000 years from the from the Kaibab Plateau, South Kaibab Plateau uh, through down to to emerge at the springs on the floor of the canyon. So thousands of years of, of transport time. The water, um, the way it works is that the water passes down through permeable rocks, hits some kind of impermeable layer, and the water and the springs flow out. And so these impermeable layers are typically shales, uh, clay-rich uh, uh, beds that, that prevent water from moving down through them. So we end up with cooler and iron, uh, low, low iron content water at upper elevations, high water quality, some of the basalt aquifers up, in the, up in, around Flagstaff and on the rims. And then these really remarkably uh, chemically enriched uh, waters that, that have emerged uh, over very long, flow path uh, durations uh, at lower elevations. 
There's also a very tiny amount of water that com comes out of crustal degassing. Laura, Laura Crossy has done a lot of wonderful work on this with her husband, Carl Karstrom, and finding that there's a trace amounts of, of water coming from, from uh, uh, crustal degassing, which is very informative about deep geologic process. So kind of a cool story there. Sometimes when you see bubbles emerging up out of a spring, they might contain helium that's coming out of that crustal degassing process. So the, like I say, the, flow, the variability in flow path length is pretty great in Arizona. At, at Vasey's Paradise, Peter Huntoon uh, has uh, uh, examined flows there as, as, uh, as Ben Tobin and others have, have done as well. The flow path might be as little as 18 hours to, to, from infiltrating uh, precipitation to emergence at, at, uh, at Vasey's Paradise up in upper, upper Marble Canyon. And in contrast, Montezuma Well and some springs in Grand Canyon have very, very long flow paths. In case of Montezuma Well, it's a 100 kilometer long flow path that, that takes 13,300 years. So uh, some of the springs in the landscape, Montezuma Well is not in Grand Canyon, but some of the springs in Grand Canyon have 3,000 plus year flow paths and they're warm and minerally enriched. Well, that's all well and good. What do springs look like when they come out of the ground? There's a wide array of spring types. We've documented at, uh, at least a dozen active spring types, and there's some pictures of some of them. If you get the chance to climb up on the San Francisco peaks, you'll see an entirely unique spring type in Arizona, which is a uh, primula dominated uh, uh, alpine, alpine spring at Snowslide Spring. Very unique spring. We have spectacular springs in Grand Canyon, those uh, from Roaring Springs that actually provide water for or the six million visitors a year that come to Grand Canyon, other gushets like Vasey's Paradise, Thunder River, et cetera, hanging gardens uh, uh, such as Cliff Spring up at the North Rim. An unusual, very unusual uh, natural type to find are hypocrines, where there's not, the, the groundwater is actually expressed through wetland vegetation. The surface of the soils there is actually dry, but, uh, but we have wetland vegetation that's capturing shallow groundwater and, and, uh, and expressing it that way. And then hill slope and and uh, wet, wet meadow springs. And very rare on the Colorado Plateau are limnocrine springs, pool forming springs. We've got one at Lava Well at Lava Falls in Grand Canyon. These features, limnocrine springs and hanging gardens and some of the hill slope springs are three places where we typically find unique species. Collectively, the springs that come out in Grand Canyon produce kind of not very much water on the, on the, uh, up on the rim, but lots and lots of water coming out of the, through the perennial tributaries within Grand Canyon. About 100 liters a second comes out from springs on the rim of Grand Canyon, but 10,000 liters a second comes out of springs like Blue, the Blue Springs Complex, Havasu Springs, Thunder River, Tapeats, uh, Tapeats Creek, etc. And so collectively, um, springs provide about half a million acre feet of, of flow into the Colorado River uh, per year. This is about 5%, between 5 and 8% of the, of the water usage of Arizona. So springs in Arizona are actually contributing to the flow of the, Col of the, of the uh, Colorado River. Riley Swanson just finished up uh, his master's thesis on that topic, and there's a new publication out on that if you're interested in that story, working with Abe Springer. What makes springs also really, really fascinating is that they are a mosaic of different microhabitats. This is Thunder Spring in Grand Canyon, a uh, huge, beautiful spring that pours out of a cliff. It's a, it's a, a gushing spring, but it's got, you know, nearly a dozen different microhabitats, each of which supports its own suite of species. You know, there are species that live in these madiculous sheets of white flowing, uh, uh, shallow uh, white water flowing over cliff faces. They live there and nowhere else. They come out to um, they may come out to emerge some caddisflies, beetles, etc., some mosses, but really that's their habitat, and, and you won't find them anywhere else. And wet meadows, adjacent cliff faces, caves, a gallery forests of riparian habitat, the hyporheic zone is the, the saturated zone below the floor of a stream. Every time we look at those settings, we see more uh, we, see, we see species we had uh, hadn't detected before. The complexity of the environment around uh, of springs influences the density of species, the plant species there. So geomorphic, as geomorphic diversity increases within a spring, the number of plant species increases fairly, uh, fairly dramatically. Well, what are some of the species that live at, at springs? Spring biodiversity, as I said, is great everywhere. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's particularly apparent in desert areas. 
and on in seafloor vents, but it's also really large in even in forested eastern U.S. where there's lots of water or in, in the tropics. The patterns of, of life that we see at springs are that springs are gathering points for all kinds of species. It's not at all unusual to have, you know, upland conifers occupying a spring, along with fairly common riparian plants, cardinal monkey flower, for example. And then we have suites of species that are maybe widespread, but completely restricted to springs. So Helleborine orchid here in the Southwest, the only place you find it is at springs, even though it's fairly wide, fairly widely distributed. And then you might have truly uh, kind of unique local endemics like McDougal slaveria, found only at a few springs in Grand Canyon. Michael Teru and I found this species, uh, discovered the species in 1975 in Grand Canyon. It, it lives at just a few springs uh, that are limestone precipitating springs. So it's an array of species, a big array of species, highly concentrated. Typically the concentrations of species at springs is orders of magnitude higher than the surrounding landscape. Plants are one thing, lots of adventures in botany there, but the adventures in invertebrates is truly staggering. The number of invertebrate species that are, uh, that are unique in springs or that are rare and found uh, and only known from springs is just enormous. The poster child of all these is probably Pergolopsis. We've got 180 springs dependent species of, of uh, spring snails in North America, 120 species of, of the, in the genus Pergolopsis, Almost all of them occur at just one or two or three springs. We discovered and described a species in the wall, on the Wallapai Reservation in, in uh, Diamond Creek in uh, Peach Springs Wash a few years back. The uh, Canab Amber Snail, a, a unique wetland snail that occurs just at three places in Grand Canyon, is also a springs-dependent species. Stoneflies, isopods, worms, uh, some of these groups we don't have taxonomists for, so, so there are many new species to be discovered. I discovered this dragonfly here, the, the masked club skimmer uh, would, that occurs at about, 10, eight, eight, about eight or 10 springs uh, in Grand Canyon, the only place it, that it breeds in the US. But many groups that we, uh, we need more resolution on. In terms of vertebrates, it's a bit of a different story. We don't have that many vertebrates that are, that are truly springs dependent. One could argue that because the Gila Saipa breeds preferentially in the, in the outflow of, of Blue Springs in the Little Colorado River that it might be a springs dependent species. A little easier case to make might be leopard frogs, two species in Grand Canyon. Uh, uh, both of them are springs dependent or were springs dependent. One of them has been extirpated. In terms of birds, there's really only one bird in North America that's, uh, that's springs dependent and that's the American Dipper. And the reason they're springs dependent is they build their nests behind waterfalls the waterfalls are always spring-fed here, and uh, they use moss that they collect from the from the uh, uh, from the surrounding landscape. If you ever get to hear a dipper sing, you'll be astounded. Their their song is this. It's like a bird's imitation of the sound of water. Fabulous song, worth actually going out doing an expedition to to hear them sing in May. In terms of other vertebrates, uh, reptiles, uh, well. Uh, Grand Canyon pink rattlesnake that Eddie McKee discovered um, is not a springs dependent animal, but where you find them most often is in the riparian zones and springs are figuring prominently as, as habitat for that species. Voles are very commonly uh, found at springs. They are uh, during times of drought, the whole surrounding landscape might dry out and the only population remaining uh, would be uh, is often around the spring. Bighorn sheep are not springs dependent, are they? Well, if the only source of water in the landscape is a spring, I guess that makes them springs dependent. But vertebrates are, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a different story than, than the invertebrates, uh, which tend to be much more uh, likely to, to be endemic at springs. All right, so what do humans do to springs? Um, we guard them jealously. We always have and we always will, I suppose. Springs are pretty small features in the landscape. They get overlooked in, in regional mapping. They've been widely neglected uh, everywhere in the world, and that's really created all kinds of problems. But um, uh, this is a this is a spring in Western Grand Canyon. The landowners there are pretty proud of it. But um, it just is uh, is one indication that that human use of springs is kind of a a different story. Native Americans. I'm not a Native American, so I can't really truly grasp the importance of springs to them, but uh, to the tribes. But uh, every tribe I've talked to 
value springs enormously. We do workshops on uh, and give presentations to tribes and help them with their water resource management issues. Every tribe has expressed deep concern for the for the health and well-being of their springs. This is a painting done by uh, uh, by Jay Matterness uh, uh, for National Geographic, uh, depicting some of Vance Haynes' excavations of of large megafaunal uh, mammal kills at springs around the Southwest. Um, springs are used as ambush sites. Uh, they were then, they still are by our modern hunters. About 1100 years ago, an, an image began to appear all across the Southern US of something that, uh, that uh, Amadeo Ray called the, uh, uh, the horned serpent. Not the feathered serpent, but the horned serpent. This is a subterranean creature that emerges at the, at the mouth of springs. It's evil tempered, has, uh, is quite noisy, has bad breath and uh, sometimes impregnates bathing women. So a lot of restrictions on women bathing at springs in some of the Native American tribes. But the image shows up all across the Southwest and into Mexico and the and Southern US uh, overall. And uh, it indicates kind of a deep connection for, and a living hydrology perspective uh, that the Native Americans might, might have. Again, I'm not a Native American, can't really speak for them, but the values that they, uh, talk about are pretty deep and, and profound. Nowadays, we use springs as, a, as, a, uh, as commodities. And so we pump the groundwater for agriculture, sometimes for potable water supplies here in Flagstaff. About 15% of our water comes from springs. Several European capitals receive all of their water from springs. The Roman aqueducts are all uh, major uh, water conveyance features from springs to urban centers. So Potable water supplies is a big part of what springs are about. And everywhere, pretty much, springs are used for livestock watering. Uh, that's becoming more and more apparent and problematic. Humans disturb the, the, the ge geomorphic uh, setting of the spring, and that can alter what kinds of species can live there. We're also polluting groundwater in a lot of different habitats. And so uh, those agricultural and, and uh, mining waste uh, pollution factors are really influencing the quality of, of water in places like Florida um, in many parts of the, of the world. As we dewater springs, we're creating more and more habitat fragmentation that uh, is problematic for species that actually jump from spring to spring, decreases their ability to find the springs. Uh, certainly we're diverting flow from springs, loving them to death through recreational impacts, especially hot springs. It's very difficult to find even a any wild hot springs anymore because they've all been developed into, into uh, resorts and whatnot. We're also bringing in lots of non-native species into, into springs, aquarium fish, crayfish, bullfrogs. Uh, many non-native plants have, have invaded our, our, our springs. And then climate change is also, a, a, of course, a, a, the big elephant in the room. As climate dries and warms, less snowpack, less even less infiltration than we've already got. And um, what's the prognosis for our for our springs? Also, as drought takes place, uh, we tend to use uh, groundwater three to five times uh, more than we do during non-drought years. So, uh, climate change is really exerting big potential impacts on our on our springs. Because of those reasons, uh, we developed the Museum in Northern Arizona Spring Stewardship Institute uh, with its Springs Online database, and so we're providing tools for. Uh, for documenting, archiving that information, for, um, for storing inventory and assessment data uh, and monitoring data as well, and, um, and use uh, that Springs Online database to, to be able to report quickly and accurately and comprehensively about the condition of a spring and, uh, and on springs dependent species. Just uh, a month ago, we finished up development of the of uh, the uh, spring snail conservation strategy for the states of Nevada and Utah that uh, involves conservation of 103 spring snail species at likely more than 10,000 springs. It's the biggest springs conservation project in the world. Spring Stewardship Institute work, works with many different land managing agencies, natural resource agencies, tribes, uh, NGOs, students, researchers, et cetera, on, on springs. And so, uh, you can find us at springstewardshipinstitute.org if you're interested and, and learn to, to learn more about it, visit the website.
So um, the Springs Online database is secure, it's easy to use, it's a relational database that allows us to ask questions that we haven't even begun to think about yet. For example, with all these different upland and wetland species occurring across elevation at springs that come out in different uh, aspects, we begin to ask the question, or begin to be able to answer the question of, of how does aspect and elevation influence the distribution of plant species? So it's a really just wonderful big open topic. We've got now actually more than 155,000 springs in the database and more than set, and more than a thousand users, including many agencies, as I said, uh, as well as Native American tribes, NGOs, and and the public. So um, we're really working to provide these tools, trainings, uh, opportunities for learning more about springs to the managers and providing them with the um, the, the means to be able to make good decisions about how to manage springs. We uh, advise and help uh, and help with the, the restoration of springs where, where people are interested in doing so. And springs are actually quite easy to rehabilitate. Um, uh, this is a, a big site called Pacoon Spring in Northwestern Arizona, comes into Grand Wash, very lower end of, of the uh, Grand Canyon area. And uh, this is a restoration project that we, we ran from 2000 and about 2005 to 2012. And um, it had been, the ranch had been an, um, used for livestock grazing for more than a hundred years. The previous owner had then turned it into an ostrich ranch and, um, and had brought in mega tonnage of, of, old, of equipment and fencing and whatnot. All of that had to be removed. We reopened the springs, allowed them to flow back into their natural channels, uh, recreated the longest perennial stream now in the National Monument. And, um, and really just a tremendous success, success story. Seeds of wetland plants that hadn't been ever, even ever detected in, in uh, that portion of Northern Arizona began to germinate out of the soil. So there's, there's, there's a lot of resilience at springs and it's really quite exciting to be able to, to um, put one of these landscapes back together and watch it recolonize. If there were any endemic species living at Pakun, they were long since killed off by all the manipulation of the springs. But in restoring it, then it becomes a habitat in which um, it, uh, tr uh, other populations, rare populations that, uh, from nearby springs could be translocated and saved, such as leopard frogs, maybe native fish, some, uh, uh, and some native aquatic in invertebrates in the landscape, including spring snails for that matter. So, uh, so the good news is the, lands the, the springs landscape can be rehabilitated. It takes some, often takes some work, but, um, but it, it, it can be very successful and uh, then provides a way to uh, recover some of the ecological functionality of the landscape. These are really important sites for, for bird life. Some springs we visit and we might see, uh, I think our record is 35 bird species in a half hour coming into water. Just tremendous use of, of, the, of springs as keystone ecosystems in the landscape. So um, through the museum and, and uh, our collaborations with many other uh, organizations, we've been able to bring some attention to springs uh, here, uh, not only here on the Colorado Plateau, but also everywhere. Now to let you know that there are interesting resources that are coming about, some books, one that we did on Arid Land Springs in North America and a, an Arizona Springs Restoration Handbook, but uh, elsewhere in the landscape, uh, other people are putting, in, in the US, uh, other people are putting out books on springs and uh, quite a bit of, of um, uh, additional uh, literature is coming out. So if you're interested in any of this, please get a hold of me, Larry at springstewardship.org or uh, lstevens at moosnaz.org. And we can make sure that you uh, get the information you're interested in. So with that, thank you very much. Leave you with a picture of a, of a triple alcove, upper triple alcove at Grand Canyon, of just a spectacular hanging garden. Um, really want to acknowledge all of our great staff at the Spring Stewardship Institute, Jerry Ledbetter, Andrea Hazelton, Jeff Janess and Brianna Mann. Uh, we work very closely with Abe Springer and his students at NAU and many other collaborators, assistants, volunteers, and, uh, and funders. Of course, m and uh, is, is warmly thanked, especially Christian, uh, Christian Hutchinson and Amelia George for making this presentation possible. So thank you very much. One quick question that um, I did have about how long does it take to rehabilitate a spring in your experience? Well, uh, good question. It depends on the spring and depends on how um, 
uh, it's been altered. So in the case of Pakun Spring, that was an 80 acre patch of land with 10 different sources. Um, the landowner had excavated every source and turned it into a, a pool to support ostriches and cows and had built all kinds of structures all across the landscape. So that process took about five years to clear out all the, all the stuff after he sold the land to the, to the BLM and then uh, recontour the landscape, uh, revegetate it and have it, have it begin to recover. We were amazed that uh, as soon as we began to recover the, the uh, geomorphic kind of configuration of the landscape, colonization by native plants just took off. It was just really wonderful to see. Within the first year uh, after we had uh, had come in and regraded it and, and allowed the springs to find their own course through the landscape, uh, we had just tremendous regeneration. Other springs that may be not so heavily altered uh, uh, don't take very much. Sometimes all it takes is construction of a stepping stone trail or constructing a fence to keep uh, you know cows out of a site and the spring can be re rehabilitated very inexpensively and very quickly. Uh, thank you so much, Larry, for your time, for the wonderful presentation.